Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Judy Taronchuk. I'm a retired neuroscience researcher and teacher. Many years ago, I taught a course at UBC called the psychology of sex differences in the psychology department. And then later a similar course at UBC, although we called it psychology of gender differences then. So today's topic is of, <laughs> is of great interest to me. Um, our guest speaker is Abigail Favalli, who is a writer and professor at the McGrath Institute for Church Life at the University of Notre Dame. Abigail's academic background is in gender studies and feminist literary criticism. Uh, presently, she writes at the intersection of theology, literature, and women's studies. Her interest as a writer and scholar uh, is in the meaning and dignity of women. And her recent work explores sexual difference and embodiment in the Catholic imagination. Abigail has a bachelor's degree in philosophy from George Fox and a master's and PhD in English lit from St. Andrews in Scotland. Her first book, The Gay Ray, Incarnation and Contemporary Women's Fiction, was awarded the 2014 Feminist and Women's Studies Association Book Award. Her second book, Into the Deep, An Unlikely Catholic Conversation, an Unlikely Catholic Conversion, <laughs> traces her spiritual journey. Her most recent book, and our topic for today, is The Genesis of Gender, a Christian Theory, published in 2022 by Ignatius Press. And she lives with her husband and their four children in South Bend, Indiana. I want to warmly welcome Abigail to our discussion today. Yeah, thank you so much for, for having me and for rescheduling this. When I was supposed to speak last time, I had a sick child. So, um, and I actually have sick children today too, but my husband's able to watch them. It just seems like there's, it's like a merry-go-round this time of year, you know, and I've got four of them. So it just kind of like will hop from one to another. So, um, yeah, well, I'm going to give a talk um, that is kind of draws from the book Genesis of Gender, and hopefully it'll be around 40 minutes or so, and then we can have time for questions and discussion. So I do have some slides to go along with my talk. So let me, um, yeah, let me share this. Does this look all right? Looks good here. Um, Right. Well, as, as Judith mentioned, I um, have an academic background in gender studies um, and literature and theology as well. Um, but I spent, for the first about 10 years of my academic life, I spent really immersed in the world of gender studies and feminist literary criticism, and then had kind of an unexpected reversion back to Christianity um, after not really practicing Christianity during that decade. Um, and so since then, I'm still really interested in these same questions, but I kind of come at them from a different angle, from more the premises of a Christian worldview, first and foremost. So I try now in my work to bring some of my kind of insider knowledge of the world of gender studies um, into dialogue with Christian theology, and also hopefully to help other Christians better navigate some of the terrain that we're in um, when it comes to gender. So this lecture will explore the genesis of gender in two ways. First of all, the more or less linear story of how the concept of gender has developed and changed forms over the last 70 years or so. And then I'll move into the second part of the lecture where I go into a worldview comparison between what I call the gender paradigm and the Christian paradigm or worldview that arises primarily from Genesis. So let's start with the gender paradigm. I like to start my story of gender with Simone de Beauvoir, and that might seem strange because she did not actually use the term gender. So her book is called The Second Sex, but she introduces in that work the concept that the term gender would soon come to name. And that concept is expressed in her most famous line from that book. One is not born, but rather becomes a woman. 
And that statement really, I think, is the mustard seed of gender theory. When Simone de Beauvoir writes that one is not born, but becomes a woman, she's making a distinction and kind of driving a wedge between the idea of woman and female and arguing that woman is more of a social and cultural fabrication that is then layered onto the biological reality of femaleness. And this distinction prefigures the turn toward the concept of gender, which would take hold in the 1970s, largely through the work of sexologist and psychologist John Money. So Money was one of the first prominent advocates of a tabula rasa view of the human person, the idea that human beings are not born as we are, but we are really made. We are products primarily of culture, first and foremost. So he argued that biological sex had no real intrinsic connection to men and women's social roles and behaviors. And he drew a distinction, a pretty hard distinction between sex as a mere biological fact, and then what he called gender, which he described more as a social identity that was a product of culture rather than nature. Now, John Money's most famous patient was David Reamer, who was brought to him as a baby after he was disfigured during a botched circumcision as, as an infant. Now, Money, who believed that gender was entirely socially constructed, uh, persuaded David's parents to raise him as a girl. Now, could David happen to be an identical twin? And so Money saw here a golden opportunity to run essentially a controlled experiment to test his theories about gender. As a teenager, David became suicidal and really didn't, he didn't know the truth about his sex, but once he learned the truth about his sex, he rejected the female identity that had been imposed upon him and took the name David. And as an adult, he got married, he adopted three children, and for a time, it seemed like he might reclaim a normal life for himself until 2004, when he tragically took his own life at the age of 38. And that was just two years after his own twin brother's self-inflicted death by overdose. So Money's attempt to demonstrate the veracity of his theories about gender's almost total malleability failed catastrophically. His theories proved not only to be erroneous, but fatal for his two research subjects. But unfortunately, this tragedy took decades to play out. And in the meantime, Money's malleable and disembodied concept of gender swept through the academy and became pretty thoroughly entrenched in feminist theory and the social sciences. Second wave feminists, in particular, latched onto this idea of gender, seeing it as a helpful site of resistance to essentialism or the idea that men and women are innately different. Instead of relying just on sex to classify men and women, a new paradigm emerged that distinguished between sex as a basic biological reality and gender as a collection of socially constructed norms and ideals that are associated with sex and then mistakenly read to be natural. So this is the classic sex-gender split, um, the second wave understanding of sex and gender that I inherited when I first began my feminist studies about 20 years ago. And it's still around, although um, increasingly not the prominent understanding of gender. So in this second wave framing, sex refers to biology and gender refers to the social meanings that are attached to sex. And you can understand why this distinction appealed to feminists, right? Because at times differences between the sexes have been understood as differences in value and have translated, been translated into rigid sex-specific roles, sometimes creating a hierarchy of inferiority and superiority in favor of men. So without the concept of gender as distinct from sex, such ideas about women were easily naturalized or seen as innate and inevitable, right? So women aren't as rational as men, so why should we educate them, right? Those sorts of ideas. Um, so these ideas were seen more as products of nature rather than distortions of culture. So with this concept of gender, feminists were trying to address this problem to make a distinction between what is cultural and what is innate. However, in the 1980s, in the late 1980s, this neat sex-gender distinction begins to unravel, thanks um, largely in part to the work <clears throat> of Judith Butler, who's I would really say is kind of the godmother of gender theory. So in her early work, Butler really ups the ante of social constructionism. And so she actually makes the claim that biological sex, sex itself is a social fabrication. So she writes in her book, Gender Trouble, that female no longer appears to be a stable notion. Its meaning is as troubled and unfixed as woman. So Butler here is leaning into many of the ideas asserted by Simone de Beauvoir 
um, but taking them kind of to further extremes. Near the end of the second sex, Simone de Beauvoir proclaims, nothing is natural. And for Butler, that statement really is a foundational premise of her work. So the idea that humankind is characterized by two sexes that are biologically complementary for Butler is a social fiction rather than a matter of fact. So Butler's philosophy, which relies heavily on Michel Foucault, can really be described as anti-realist. So truth is suspended in air quotes as something that's ultimately unknowable or non-existent. And so all that really remains is power. So what we consider to be knowledge or truth is actually a product of social and institutional power rather than a reflection of reality. So knowledge then is not a matter of discerning or recognizing what is true because truth itself is primarily a construction of power. So gender theory in this mode rejects the idea that the term sex or gender and any related terms, female, man, woman, gender theory rejects the idea that those terms name something real. Instead, those concepts are seen as linguistic power moves that create the illusion of something real. So once this distance or this distinction between like bodily sex and identity was enabled via gender in the mid 20th century, it did not take long, merely a few decades for gender to shift meanings once again, becoming entirely disconnected from sex. And this disconnection paved the way for an even more fragmented understanding of the human person to emerge, which I'll call, for the sake of this lecture, I'll call it gender identity theory. So according to this theory, which is well represented here by the, the um, gender unicorn image, according to this theory, one's identity as a man or a woman, or both or neither, is based on one's subjective self-perception. So this theory separates gender, manness, womanness, from biological sex, and roots sexed identity in self-perception rather than the body. So you can see this in the image of the, the thought bubble with the rainbow in it. Like that is the location of gender is in that subjective self-perception. So this, um, so in, in cases of a felt incongruence then between gender identity and one sex, between the thought bubble and the organization of the body, this model, gender identity theory, affirms the subjective sense of gender over the objective fact of sex. Now, some of you might be picking up on an interesting paradox here. So the idea that gender is purely a social construct, something that is imposed upon us by society, is markedly different from the idea that gender is a real, innate, immutable identity that one accesses through self-perception. So these are actually, I would, I would argue, contradictory ideas. So we have gender as a social construct um, and gender as an innate identity. Now you could say, of course, that we internalize social constructs and they become something like innate identities, but that's not what gender identity theory claims. Rather, the claim is that gender identity is a truth so profound that you can realize it at a young age and your body must be brought into alignment with this inner truth. And in fact, this inner truth might actually be at odds with your socialization as a girl or a boy. So that's something that's that's very different from the social constructionism of earlier forms of gender theory. Hold on just a second. I got to look see where I am in my slides. Okay. So gender identity theory makes realist or even essentialist claims about gender. She is a girl trapped in a boy's body or trans women are women. So there's a, a reification turn that's happening here. Now to reify means to make real. So the radical social constructionism of Butler it's what I, this is kind of my argument here in the tale I'm telling, that the radical social constructionism of Butler have dethroned the reality of sexual difference. And so this anti-realist move, this deconstructionist move, has then cleared the way, maybe somewhat ironically, for a new realism to emerge, one that's based not on the objective, intelligible, or sensible world, but on one subjective sense of self. So it's like a subjectivist realism. 
So we're seeing two moves in this unfolding conceptual revolution. First, deconstruction, and then reification. So first, what is taken to be real or factual, so the idea of biological sex, is dismantled through anti-realist gender theory. But then in its reality is now asserted. So this brings us to a bewildering reversal of the sex gender split from second wave feminism, in which, if you'll remember, sex was the biological fact and gender the social construct. But now in our time, increasingly, sex is presented as the construct, whereas gender, that self-perception, that innate identity, is what is presented as real. So let's let's leave this linear story now and move into a worldview comparison between the gender paradigm and the worldview of the Christian cosmos, which I'm going to call the Genesis paradigm. Behind all these different understandings of gender is an implicit anthropology or an implicit understanding of the human person, as well as an implicit understanding of ontology or reality. In other words, definitions of gender make claims, whether explicitly or implicitly, about who we are and what is real. And these are not of side issues, right? These are very foundational worldview questions. So approaching this topic as Christians requires that we hold it up to the light of divine revelation. So we can't answer the question of gender wholly from outside scripture, but we also have to reckon with um, what divine revelation has to say. But why Genesis? right, of all the Bible, why that weird and wonderful book? Well, Genesis is our origin story. And in the ancient world, origin stories are not primarily about material origins. You know, they're not as concerned about the age of the earth, the evolution of the species, right? Those are modern preoccupations. Rather, ancient creation stories are about giving an account of identity and purpose. Now, in the Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus is questioned by the Pharisees about whether divorce is permissible, he makes an interesting move. He refers back to Genesis, to the original order of creation. He doesn't appeal to the law when confronted with questions about how men and women should relate to one another. Instead, he appeals to cosmology, to the sacred narratives of Genesis that give an account of our identity and purpose as human beings. So this move tells us that Genesis still speaks the truth about men and women, even in our fallen order, about who we are and who we're created to be. So for Christians, Genesis, especially those first four chapters, those creation narratives, is our origin story that gives us a theological foundation to understand our ideology, so our origin, our anthropology or our nature, and also our teleology, our purpose, the, the end for which we're made. So how do these two paradigms compare? I'm going to draw comparisons in several areas um, between these two, I would say, different understandings of reality, creation, freedom, the body, language, and sexual difference. So here's a um, Genesis 1, 24 through 31, just as a little refresher of the first creation narrative in Genesis. So in Genesis 1, creation unfolds in this methodical process as an integral interconnected whole, a cosmos. And each stage of this unfolding, each layer is pronounced by God as good. And it reaches an apex with the creation of human beings who are described as being made in the image of God. Genesis here recognizes as well the natural duality of humankind, male and female. And this difference is presented as part of the goodness of creation. So both sexes share fully in the divine image and the, the mission, the commission to tend the earth. So who is the creator in these two paradigms? In the gender paradigm, we are. It's human beings who really construct or um, who determine the reality, truth, and meaning about the world and also about ourselves. But in Genesis, there is a creator. There's a ground of truth, of reality and meaning. There's a God who makes himself known, who desires to be in relationship with his creation. So human beings in the Genesis paradigm are creatures. We are beings in relation to a God who made us. 
and who gave us a particular kind of nature that is proclaimed as good. In the gender paradigm where human beings are the creators, then reality is ultimately something human made. It's ultimately a construct. While there is some level of biological facticity, any meaning or categorization or interpretation of that facticity is seen, at least in kind of the earlier gender theory modes, as a linguistic and social construct. But in Genesis, reality is presented as a gift. There's a givenness to the world, to the nature of things that is not created by us, but intrinsic to the way things are. Reality is not under our total control, but we have been entrusted with its care, not to just recreate it in our own image, but to tend to it, to attend to its givenness that is endowed by God. So in the Christian paradigm, reality is not something ultimately something that we create, it's something that we receive. There are actually two cosmologies in Genesis. The first chapter describes creation from a transcendent vantage point, like a God's eye view. But the second chapter of Genesis zooms in, like way in, you know, we go down to the dust of Eden, we almost get like an address for Eden between these rivers. And God is depicted in bodily terms, walking and talking with the first human beings in this lush garden. So while the first account really emphasizes God's transcendence from creation, that's the second account shows us his intimacy and his intimate interactions with creation. This second creation account cuts almost immediately to the creation of the first human being. So God forms the human. The Hebrew term is Adam. It's not yet here a proper name. It's more like earthling. Um, so God forms the Adam from the hummus of the soil and breathes into his body, animating him with the divine breath of life. And this imagery here of the, the soil and the breath reveals an important truth through, through image and metaphorical language. It nonetheless reveals an important truth about our nature, that we are both earth and breath, matter and spirit. We are physical creatures. Our bodies are integral to who we are. Yet we're not merely matter, right? So this isn't affirming a materialist anthropology because God's breath um, enlivens each of us with an animating spirit. So this is one of the foundational um, aspects of a Christian anthropology that every human being is a unity of body and spirit. And in the gender paradigm, whether that's in the mode of the social construct gender theory or gender identity theory, in either version, the body does not carry its own intrinsic meaning. Rather, it must be made meaningful. It does not proclaim the truth and tell us of a loving creator. Instead, it must be carefully curated to express an inner reality. And that is seen as the true locus of the self. In verse 18 of the second chapter, something unexpected happens. God looks at his creation and for the first time, he says that something is not good. It is not good that this human being is solitary, one of a kind. And then begins one of my favorite passages, this parade of animals, right? So God gets busy shaping and molding all kinds of creatures and presenting them before the Adam to see what he would call them. So there's something comical about this imagery, right? So here comes God with a gopher or a parrot. And then the Adam like looks at it and shakes his head, right? And this misfit pageant continues. Well, eventually God goes back to the drawing board and he puts this human into a deep sleep. And from his side, God forms the first woman and presents her before the Adam. John Paul II, in his reading of Genesis, reads this sleep as a sleep of non-being. So God actually taking that first human out of existence entirely and then bringing two new human beings into existence, man and woman. So he replaces that undifferentiated, unsexed, human being with the humanity that is differentiated into two modes of being human. So the Adam, who can now properly be called a man, issues a cry of wonder upon seeing the woman for the first time, at last. There's a sense of delight in those two words, at last. So he immediately recognizes, even though she has said nothing, right? He immediately recognizes then in the language of her body, that she is both like him, more like him than any other earthly creature, but yet not like him. 
So she resembles him in their shared humanity, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, but differs in the feminine form of her humanity. So Genesis here is affirming a balance of sameness and difference between the sexes. And this is a delicate balance that is difficult, but really necessary to maintain. So most theories of gender lose this balance. And I mean, theories of gender from like Plato to Judith Butler. Like, so most theories of gender lose this balance. They veer into extremes, either of uniformity that men and women are basically interchangeable or polarity, right? Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. So both of those extremes lose the fruitful tension that's being expressed here in Genesis. So I would argue that this opening act to the second cosmology could actually be read as an origin story of sexual difference itself, because the text is so focused on this. And it's actually presented as the culmination of God's creative work in this account. So this text is proclaiming that our identities as male and female matter profoundly, and that our sexual differentiation carries sacred significance. And this occupies a prominent place in this worldview. And it's really unusual if you study other ancient creation stories. This, the dignity that is given to sexual difference is, in Genesis is, is almost whole, is wholly unique. I, I see nothing like it. And it's interesting to me, at least in the English translations, that the two times the text breaks out into song in both Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are both about sexual difference. So what then is this greater significance of sexual difference? I mean, clearly it holds profound temporal significance as the sole means by which human beings come into existence. Like that's a big deal. But this earthly meaning points to a deeper spiritual meaning. Sexual difference serves a sacramental purpose. It is an integral part of how we image God. So the Genesis accounts institute a dynamic between God and creation that is characterized primarily by gift, a dynamic that carries throughout the old and the new covenants that culminates in the incarnation and then Christ's sacrifice of love on the cross. God is the ultimate giver, the generous source of being, and our ultimate calling is to say yes to this gift. Now, this dynamic of gift is etched into our nature as men and women. So the female body, my female body, visibly signals the capacity for motherhood. Yet that capacity on its own is dormant. It can only be actualized by male generativity. And the same is true, vice versa. So our generative powers are dormant unless they're actualized by the gift of the other. So our distinctive generative powers to become fruitful require the generosity and receptivity of the other. We receive the generative potential of the other, even as we give of our own generativity. Thus, man and woman with our co-generative powers have the unique capacity to form an interpersonal communion that can also create life. And this is, a, is an image, even if distant, an image of the divine. The Christian understanding of God as Trinity is that God is an interpersonal communion who is life-giving. And through our sex sexual differentiation, we image the Trinity in a profound way. The sexes are a primordial sacrament of this di divine economy of gift. In addition to proclaiming the generative meaning of the body, sexual difference also reveals the nuptial meaning of the body and is thus a sign of the nuptial character of divine human communion. All throughout scripture, God's relationship with humankind is depicted as nuptial, initially in the covenant with Israel and then culminating in the union of Christ and the church. And this is yet another way that sexual difference carries a higher iconic meaning in the sacramental economy. So these are not mere symbols, empty or arbitrary, but on the contrary are revealing something very profound about ultimate reality. Now, I want to make clear here that this sacramental meaning of sexual difference is proclaimed by the body of every man and every woman. We are living icons of these realities in the very structure of our nature. Whether or not we ever become mothers or fathers or brides or bridegrooms in a literal temporal sense, we all participate and signify this higher meaning. Sexual difference then is a sign that efficaciously transmits into the visible world the invisible mystery hidden in God from eternity. 
the visible revealing the invisible. That's the sacramental dynamic. So to define man and woman as an internal cognitive experience as something invisible that must be imposed upon the visible, this is a direct reversal of the sacramental dynamic and it effaces the body's inherent sacramental meaning. I also wanna make a point of contrast when it comes to language. So these two paradigms present distinct understandings of the relationship between language and truth. Both of the Genesis cosmologies depict a particular relationship between language and reality. In the first account, we have an emphasis on divine speech. God uses language to create the cosmos out of nothing, ex nihilo. He draws order and being out of nothingness. In the second account, the text shifts to focus on the role of human speech. The man uses language to name what God creates. So to put it simply, divine speech makes reality, human speech names reality. In the parade of animals, the human's act of naming does not impose meaning arbitrarily, but rather it recognizes meaning that objectively exists in what God has made. God creates the animal and presents it to the man who discerns its distinct nature and bestows a name that proclaims that nature. And this dynamic is even more dramatic in the naming of woman. The man first recognizes that the woman shares his nature, but in a modality that is distinct from his own. And after seeing this nature proclaimed by her body, the man then chooses a word that corresponds to that twofold reality, isha or woman. So this is a word that includes the word ish, man, while adding something new, right? So the word itself names that tension between sameness and difference. So these terms, man and woman, first appear in the text during this climactic encounter. It's a moment of mutual recognition. The man is both naming woman and also naming himself. It is through encountering her nature that he is able to comprehend his own. Throughout this second account, naming then is depicted as a linguistic response to that which is being named. So reality, what God has created, exists prior to our naming it. And our language is true and meaningful when it corresponds to what exists. Now, this understanding of language contrasts starkly with the view that dominates contemporary debates about gender. So most constructionist gender theories hold that what we think of as reality is primarily a linguistic and social construction. Our use of the terms woman and man, so this theory goes, actually create the illusion that sex is a binary. Now, this constructionist view of language is a complete inversion of the correspondence view depicted in Genesis. In the divinely revealed origin story, meaning intrinsically exists in what God creates. And this meaning is intelligible to us. Right? And language is a mark of God's image in us and enables us to name and proclaim that inherent meaning. Lastly, freedom. In the gender paradigm, freedom is often presented as pushing past limits, dismantling norms, blurring boundaries, disrupting categories. Freedom, especially in the postmodern theory of Judith Butler, means subverting any categories that are said to be natural or based in our nature. In other words, freedom ultimately is transgression. It's freedom from our natural limits. But in the Genesis paradigm, freedom is belonging. Freedom is found by becoming who we were made to be. The Genesis narrative follows a trajectory from harmony to fragmentation. This original wholeness of Eden disintegrates into conflict and division. That's what sin is ultimately, a corruption of wholeness. Ours is an origin story that ends in exile, man and woman expelled from Eden and left to wander the earth. Could this perhaps be a vision of freedom? Human being no longer corralled in God's garden, encumbered by God's rules, but liberated to find his own meaning, to seek her own destiny. That is what freedom has become in our historical moment. Stripped from teleology, from any sense of ultimate purpose, freedom has been reduced to permissiveness, pushing past limits. But in Genesis, the exile from Eden is not triumphant. It's not liberating. It's agonizing. It's weighted down 
by the pall of death. We're confronted in our time with two divergent understandings of freedom. On the one hand, freedom according to postmodernity, this open-ended process of self-definition whose only limit is death. On the other hand, in Genesis and throughout scripture, we're offered a sense of freedom as an ever deepening sense of belonging and wholeness and restoration through God's grace, not only within oneself, right? Grace healing the fractures within ourselves, but also healing the fractures between men and women, between God and humankind. To be Christian is to regard oneself as part of creation and creation in relation to God. And how we choose to relate to one of these, self, creation, God, subtly influences how we relate to all of these. So I cannot truly honor creation if I do not honor my own body, which itself is a part of creation. The body is a gift. More than that, it is a revelatory gift. <clears throat> it is part of God's self-disclosure to us. That's the Christian view. And Christians haven't always been faithful at bear bearing that witness. There is an ever-present temptation toward dualism, toward seeing the body merely as a burden, an empty shell, a meat suit that's separate from the true self. And the technologies and theories of our time may be, may be novel, but this underlying impulse to denigrate and reject the body is ancient. But we are a people of the incarnation. That's the heart of Christianity. God becoming a human in body and soul for our sake in order to bear a bodily death and then to raise that body from the dead, right? Glorified in all eternity. Like the body comes back. <laughs> he didn't just use it to die on the cross, right? There's the resurrection, the ascension. All of the central mysteries of the Christian faith take for granted that the body is intrinsic to human personhood. So a disembodied concept of gender, one that is totally abstracted away from, bio from bodily sex, ultimately erases this Christian witness about the goodness and givenness of the body, particularly in its sacramental meaning. And it's not the idealized body that's a gift, right? The airbrushed body suspended in the amber of perpetual health and conventional beauty, the carefully curated Instagram body that just manifests a fantasy. No, we find the body's giftedness within its limits, its flaws, its finitude, because these limits reveal to us our creatureliness, our need for God's love and his saving power. <clears throat> I'd like to end with a brief postscript. <clears throat> I've been speaking today about theories, concepts, theology, blah, 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 all, all important things, my favorite kinds of things. But we have to be careful never to lose sight of the person Theories, frameworks should be examined and critiqued and, if necessary, rejected. But persons must always be welcomed with reverence and love. And this is a distinction we have to hold while also acknowledging that the theories and frameworks on offer often have a, they have a profound effect on how we understand ourselves and interpret our experiences. But an individual person is often, for the most part, not a perfect manifestation of a theory or an ideology. Persons are unique and complex and always beloved. So in this time of confusion and turmoil on the question, the very important question of anthropology and gender, I think we have a dual calling as Christians, fidelity and receptivity. On the one hand, there's a prophetic call to fidelity, to guard and profess the witness of Christian scripture and tradition even when, especially when, it cuts against the dominant theories of our time. So here I would urge both personal and institutional, in the sense of churches, institutional fidelity. But simultaneously, both as people and as churches, we must be receptive. We must be ready to receive the person as he or she is, to welcome the seeker with warmth and tenderness. So to the person, we must be radically open. This dual calling of fidelity and receptivity is conveyed in a letter on human sexuality that was released by the Catholic Nordic bishops last year, almost exactly a year ago, actually, last March. So I'll let them have the last word. Notions of what it is to be a human and so a sexual being are in flux. 
What is taken for granted today may be rejected tomorrow. Anyone who stakes much on passing theories risks being terribly hurt. We need deep roots. Let us try then to appropriate the fundamental principles of Christian anthropology while reaching out in friendship with respect to those who feel estranged by them. We owe it to the Lord, to ourselves and to our world to give an account of what we believe and why we believe it to be true. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abigail. Appreciate that a lot. You remind me so much of um, my PhD work on the dialogue between Foucault and Taylor on the, uh, you know, the constitution of the moral self. <laughs> so, oh, wow. Kind of interesting. interesting. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That was, that was a, a road hoe. Um, now, one of the things that I came up with in my thinking was um, that one of the things that tends to be dominant in today's uh, late modern culture is the ideology of the aesthetic. And I think you mentioned that a little bit in your book, um, in terms of subjectivity or feeling, the feeling I have about myself, et cetera. You wanna comment a little bit on this, uh, how the aesthetic plays in this discussion? I think yeah, of the, the, the you know, the threefold, uh, of uh, Kierkegaard, you know, the aesthetic, the ethical, mm. the religious, yeah. That we seem to have imploded in some sense down to the aesthetic. Yes, I think that's accurate. That's a good, that's a good way to put it. Um, and some, some other thinkers like Taylor, for example, or Carl Truman have really emphasized the expressivist individualism, right? That kind right. of characterizes yeah. our time. Um, and this this is very interesting, right? And there's also an aesthetic dimension to it in in a, in a more in a basic sense where we're profoundly well. For one thing, we're bombarded with images of ourselves the whole time, like all the time. You know, I've just mm -hmm. been giving a lecture, and I could have been watching my face the whole time I was giving the lecture, almost like I'm talking to a mirror. You know, so there's a strange way in which we're constantly bombarded with an image of ourselves in a way that is completely unprecedented historically. So we're more aware of how we show up in the world, how we present to the world than we ever have been before. And I think that's becoming this almost like preoccupation, this almost pathology in a way that that becomes what defines us in terms of identity. It is, it is the appearance that we present to the world. It is what we express visibly to the world that then has to be kind of validated by the external world in order to mm -hmm. be made real, right? So I really think in terms of the, there's, I mean, I talked all, a lot today about the conceptual revolution, and I think there's a concurrent technological revolution because all of these ideas that I've been talking about have also been influenced by technological innovations. And one of those I think is um, the kind of world of the internet and social media and, mm -hmm. and the way we think about identity almost now as something a, a visible thing that must be curated and externally validated like that's what that's what identity has become and that's kind of what gender has become or what it means to be man or a woman so there's a way in which this is about gender but there's also a way in which it's just about how we think about identity as a whole and one of the things that fascinates me about that is that there's something true about it like there almost seems to be this kind of sacramental impulse there this desire for the visible to reveal the invisible there's a desire for the way I look in the world to somehow express who I am inside, right? So there's mm -hmm. there's this kind of like impulse there that's getting at something real, but in a way I think that is that is off base, right? Because it overlooks the goodness of just who we are, not as a, a kind of curated avatar, right? Mm -hmm. But actually in the nature in the nature that we're given, and so I think it's it's kind of a matter of like finding these like good impulses that are present and trying to kind of like show that like, yes, there's something good about that desire, but it's being, it's, it's being kind of heightened and and distorted and exaggerated in a way that's actually hiding um, our true identity. If that makes sense. And of course, then there's also the element of consumerism and how that's, that's also driving this process as well. Um, 
we kind of create ourselves to be an image of consumption, to be an image that is consumed by others, right? So there are all kinds of dynamics in our culture that are coalescing in this phenomenon in a in a strange way. Yeah, I think of uh, young young people who are uh, becoming these TikTok stars with a million followers, and uh, they're making a living. They're making a living off of their TikTok celebrity, and um, so they've seen it in the movies. They've seen it in Hollywood, etc. And now they've seen that, oh, I can become a celebrity if I just curate myself in the right way, uh, according to the consumer culture that uh, with the likes, et cetera, you know, and the number of hits on right. my site. And know. that's the validation piece, right? Because this understanding of identity is incredibly fragile mm -hmm. because it, it mm -hmm. requires the continual validation. And then if you don't get that, then it's profoundly destabilizing to one's identity, right? So mm -hmm. there's... It's very anxiety producing as well. Right, right. Well, I'll throw it out to other people for questions. I think I see that Judy has a question as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'd just like to follow up on this idea that you just discussed. It's, it's very um, obvious uh, from the data that the, there's been a tremendous increase in the last, I don't know, the last 10 years or so in the number of adolescent females who desire, who, who claim to have gender dysphoria and wish to transition. And at the same time, um, parallel to this, a tremendous increase in anxiety and depression in adolescent girls. And um, this, as um, psychologists like, like John Haidt, for example, has, has pointed out, all of this parallels the uh, rise of different social media and our use of, of cell phones, uh, the way kids are constantly on their cell phones, TikTok, Instagram, on and on and on. And this seems to affect teenage girls, perhaps more than boys. I mean, the, the evidence now is that most people who want to, uh, who claim gender dysphoria are in fact girl, teenage girls that um, the emphasis on attractiveness, how our physical bodies look and how TikTok and so on um, stresses this. So what do you think if our culture were to place less emphasis on <laughs> the attractiveness of our bodies, less emphasis on these sexually stereotyped um, attractive points, you know, having a, a gorgeous body, a gorgeous figure and so on. If, if and, and, you know, teenage girls being in transition with their bodies find all this very uncomfortable. If we mm -hmm. were to somehow place less emphasis on these stereotypes, would there be fewer gender dysphoric people? Well, I think, I think there's a, I think one of the things that's happening right now is that all kinds of different forms of distress from all kinds of different sources are being attached to this one thing like oh this is really about gender right so for for one young person it could be you know feeling uncomfortable during puberty um you know maybe being gender atypical and then getting these highly stereotypical narratives and thinking oh well i must I must then really be the opposite sex. And that's how I will alleviate this distress that I'm in, right? For another person, it could be about sexual trauma. For another person, it could be, you know, that that they're autistic and, you know, they just really don't conform to any of the gender, right? So there's all, I think the problem is that this, this narrative is so simplistic. So it reduces all kinds of, of distress and kind of attaches them to this one thing and then puts it on a pathway of, you know, if you, if you then just fix your body, you'll fix this distress that you're feeling inside. The body is kind of scapegoated in a way um, for kind of complex things that are happening in the inner life of a person. Um, but it is very interesting to me that this does play into stereotypes because yeah. once you uproot the categories of woman, man, girl, boy from the sex of the body, then the only thing that you can that gives them any kind of form or content are stereotypes, right? Mm -hmm. So then it becomes about what you look like, what kinds of things 
you like to do, how you like to dress. Um, and then this in turn kind of exaggerates those stereotypes in a way that, you know, I think most any feminist or well, feminist from maybe my generation and older would see as very regressive. It used to be that um, it was males transitioning to females was the most common form of transition. But the last 10 years or so, it has totally changed and the increase has been solely in girls. So I'm, I'm looking for a, you know, a rationale for that. Yeah, it's definitely much more pronounced in girls. So the demographics have shifted in terms of sex disparity and also in terms of age. So they've gotten much younger because it used to be that the classic person who wanted to transition would be an adult male. And now it's a, a young adult or even adolescent female, although it does still affect boys too. Um, yeah. So it's, but disproportionately young people for sure. Yeah. And disproportionately girls. And yes. I'm thinking that adolescent girls are at a stage where they're beginning to experience menstruation and, um, you know, who enjoys that really, you know, and <laughs> uh, getting over this whole bodily change thing has um, uh, maybe becomes a problem for girls when they're constantly confronted with the um, images of these, you know, beautiful, gorgeous, shapely women. Right. I see another question. I think that's Clark, is it? Yes. Uh, first of all, I just absolutely love your book, uh, Genesis. You. It's been so super helpful uh, just to, to frame this whole conversation. Uh, we have lots of people coming to our house asking questions, diverse perspectives. And we have a lot of people or we've had people who are trans identified female um, and only one trans identified male, but people and families who are affected by this. And I'm really interested in the, the language or the method that you go about it and in pointing out the sacramental nature of the body. And I feel like it can go much further in the Bible than typical cultural stereotypes that we might try to read into the text. But, and I don't know the limits of the sacramental language, but I was intrigued by when you were talking about the Genesis paradigm that you didn't use the language of sex or gender. You were just talking about body and soul. Uh, and so one, I guess my question is, uh, why? And I guess two, have you found discussing it sac about the sacramental nature of the body helpful in these discussions? Uh, because in your book, you talked you and it was very helpful uh you it was truth with love i think it was and you were describing a conversation that you had with somebody and that you came at an impasse uh where you couldn't go further but has this and i know that you've been talking about this book for some time but has the sacramental language or the method of talking about the sacramental nature of the body helped you in going further in discussions, have people even listen to that? Uh, and then also, why not sex and gender when you discussed the Bible? Yeah, so when I discussed the Bible, I used the phrase sexual difference a lot. Um, and um, so that, I think <laughs> the words sex and gender drive me crazy, to be honest, because there's this pervasive equivocation about the terms especially gender, not so much sex. Um, but even, even in, in kind of a gender identity theory framework, someone who's really fully bought into that framework, a male who has the self-concept of a female will say that his sex is female, right? So even there you have the kind of sex and gender both being kind of re redefined. Um, so I do struggle with terminology a lot because I feel like these words have so many different meanings that it's hard to be precise in one's meaning because I could say something about gender and another person will hear what I'm saying about gender to apply to a cognitive experience rather than the body, right? If they have a different understanding of gender. So there's always it's always a trick, I think, to try to clearly define where one's coming from and figure out, especially when you're when you have an interlocutor 
what, okay, what do we mean by gender here? What are we trying? So defining those terms is difficult. I find the term sexual difference to be like an easy one for me to land on. Part of that is because my, my background is actually in French feminist theory and they don't use the term gender. They don't like it. Hmm. Um, it's, it's interesting that, that gender is actually, a, it's only native to English. Anywhere else it appears in the world, it's, it's an import or an export, I guess, from English. Um, and so a lot of the, the feminist philosophies that I work, worked with use the term sexual difference instead of gender. So it's kind of a natural place for me to land. And then it also, I think, emphasizes that what I'm talking about is the differentiation of the body, you know, as kind of the ground of it. Um, but then there are other times where that's awkward, that won't work, you know, and I use the term gender. Uh, but I always have to kind of define what I mean by it carefully to make sure I can be understood. Now, as far as whether some any of these arguments are appealing to people, I mean, it's really hit and miss, you know. Um, you know, I've had I've had dialogues with, you know, a woman who has experienced a sense of disconnect with her gender, who's, who's a committed Christian, who found this sacramental theology, this sacramental understanding of herself as female to be completely world-changing and allow her to actually kind of reconcile with her sex in a way. I've also had conversations with trans-identified people for whom they just dismiss it out of hand and just say, oh, that's just, you know, that's just from John Paul II. We don't have to listen to that or something like that, you know? So I think it so much depends upon kind of the openness of the person and and kind of what, um, I think the sacramental argument will only really land with someone who is is um, attuned to the idea of divine revelation and wants to understand it better, right? Mm. I don't think I don't think it will really appeal to someone who doesn't see the world in those terms. Um, so I have found that it were it, it it like works. I mean, it's not a quick fix. It connects with Christians in a way um, sometimes, but. Christians that I've dialogued with who are committed to somehow reconciling Christian theology with more of a trans anthropology, you know, it does, it's not like a quick fix. It doesn't. No, land. It, it does seem like it does. It does find a third way rather than just uh, uh, sex or gender as a construct. It's merely a construct or people who fear uh, that, you know, maybe a, a reductionistic view mm -hmm. a materialistic form of the body uh, that it right. seems that no, the body actually has a transcendent meaning um, or meaning that yes. is given by the transcendence. And so it does seem to, to offer something more than, than the only two ways that we're often given in culture. Yeah. And that's why to me, like, this is the thing that I want to lean into and write more about because I, because of exactly what you're saying, it like resists this materialist view which, you know, you'll, you'll see more in maybe just secular gender critical spheres, like a woman's an adult human female. There's nothing, sex is just like a fact of our, our body doesn't mean anything. Right. Mm. But it's real. It's real, but it doesn't really mean anything. Right. We can't say anything more about it. Um, so that's not quite enough. Right. Like I want to say, no, it actually does have this, this greater meaning. Uh, but then it also resists the 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 kind of because you could have a very spiritualized trans anthropology but it just neglects the meaning of the body it says like the body isn't isn't meaningful um and so it does kind of offer it, it pulls away from both of those accounts in a way well thank you uh, very good uh was there another question yes sorry you, you just raised your hand uh alan Hi, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so I'm I, I appreciated that duality you presented about both fidelity and um receptivity to the person. And I'm I'm kind of struck by like receptivity uh that that is associated with um you know female in a way. I, the thing I'm 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 kind of wondering about is like there is as you know a tremendously acrimonious public i won't even call it a debate sometimes right now but just i i'm wondering 
anthropologically what's going on from with regard to those persons who are defending fidelity without having receptivity to persons. What sort of kind of understanding of the human person is is like um, saying like men or men, women or women, uh, and and failing to to uh, demonstrate the the sort of magnanimity that your theory is offering. What's going on there? Well, I think I think part of it is um, wanting to have. I I think like I I think a lot of this comes back to the unity of truth and love in Christ, right? And I think in in some ways the the divisions that we see in culture and also within the church, you have sometimes I think about it in my head as like the loveies and the truthies. So the loveies they like want to be so open to the person to the point where like if this means we have to step away from a traditional Christian sexual ethic, or we have to kind of reject the witness of scripture and tradition in order to welcome the person, then that's the cost and that's good. And that's what love looks like. Right. And then the truth, the, the truth is, I think are like, no, what really matters is holding to scripture and tradition, what is true, but then how, how do you, but then sometimes I think that can be manifest in more of like a fearful retraction, like kind of a withdrawal. Um, because it's safer, right? Like it's, you don't have to wade into the tension. Like I, <clears throat> it's, un, it's uncomfortable to dialogue with people who, you know, where what I'm saying about gender is against their own self-concept. Like it is, I don't like relish these ongoing correspondences I have, you know, <laughs> I find them to be very like difficult and um it's not fun and it, it there's i think i think there's also a fear of almost like this kind of contagion you know if any kind of gender ambiguity is is going to create scandal among young people and that sort of thing um so i i think i think that is kind of what what might be motivating it i mean i think it's understandable i'll give you like an example like a concrete example like once i was on a panel where uh, about gender and someone was asking about kind of pastoral applications and things. And, and I gave the example of a woman I know who I've spoken with, who um, was identified as trans for about 10 years, a recent convert to Christianity. Um, and she is a petite person and she looks and sounds male, like unambiguously looks and sounds male. And she's like a new Christian. She's kind of a timid person in general. And so she's, you know, she just doesn't really, she's afraid to share her history with anyone in the church. So she kind of goes to mass by herself. Um, she feels kind of like, you know, she doesn't quite fit in and doesn't know how to fit in, you know? And so I was just giving this as an example of like, because of the culture we live in, we're going to have people who are in kind of these ambiguous places Right. And it's not always like clear exactly what a person in her situation should do. And we need to be like, we need to wade into that complexity. Right. And so this, per this other person on the panel, like hit back hard, you know, and she was like, no, this person needs to fem it up. Basically. She was like, this person needs to grow out her hair, shave her beard, make it clear that she's female. And I was thinking in my head, I was like, but then she's just going to look like a dude who's trying to look like a woman, <laughs> you know, like you can't, you can't just like skip over these complexities. Like we have to kind of reckon with the fact that, um, you know, people aren't going to look like we expect them to look. And we we have to like welcome the person first and foremost, right? Um, and so I would love for our churches to be a place where someone like this woman that I'm talking about is not afraid to talk about the fact that she was on testosterone for 10 years and now she's not, but she's still figuring it out, you know? And for people not to be afraid of that or to kind of recoil from that. But also, I don't want the church to be like, oh, that's fine. You know, you're not really a woman, you're a man. <laughs> so like those are kind of the the things to avoid, um, I think. But it, it there is a cost to it. Like there's a cost, I think, to 
wading into that tension between truth and love that is often easier. It's it's an easy temptation to want to try to escape that tension. Thank you. Yes, one of the other things, uh, one of the other phenomena that seems to be occurring is that men uh, who are threatened by the, the dialogue that we're having today might retreat into the kind of um, male stereotype, uh, Iron John, or, you know, there are different popular books among men, Christian men especially, uh, which aren't necessarily healthy and lead them into uh, male stereotypes. So how would you speak to that? You know, how how do we help men um, engage this subject without recoiling or reacting in um, negative or unhelpful ways? Yeah, that's a great question. Because I, there, and it's also, at least in Catholic circles, there is this, this kind of like anti-feminist Kind of movement a little bit and a lot of them are women you know women who are i think people because of the confusion around gender in our terrain in our the confusing terrain around gender in our culture you know some people want to retreat to like very strict boxes where like men are men women are women we have very different roles we have very kind of exaggerated ways that we dress that heighten the sense of difference um and again, I understand that impulse, right? Wanting things to be clear, wanting things to be neat, wanting things to be stable again. Um, but I think that also falls into kind of the same, I mean, ironically, it's it's the same kind of impulse, right? It's defining what it means to be a man and woman in terms of stereotypes, in terms of cultural norms and expressions, rather than looking at just the fundamental reality, the fundamental differentiation, which is the potential for motherhood and the potential for fatherhood. Like that's what sex is about, right? And so as a human being, you know, that you have a body that's organized according to one potentiality um, or the other potentiality in the vast majority of cases. Um, and so what, what I think authentic masculinity and authentic femininity are it's male holiness and female holiness. Like the standard of holiness that we're called to is a human holiness. Like there aren't these virtues that women are supposed to have and these virtues that men are supposed to have, but rather they're virtues that all human beings are called to and they become feminine and masculine because of the body of the person who is virtuous. So that's kind of my thing, I guess, is to really go back to the body and um, to also highlight the diversity among men and the diversity among women as well, and to embrace that as part of God's creative design, that no two women who ever existed of all the billions of women are exactly alike. You know, I mean, that's amazing and kind of mind boggling to think about. Um, and men and women are both fully human, right? So there's kind of three levels to keep hold of. Shared humanity, so the full range of human virtues, both men and women can habituate those. Then there's the level of sexual differentiation. Well, here there is a real difference, and it's primarily a bodily difference um, that has spiritual implications as well, right? We've talked about. But then there's also the individual, and every single individual is unique and unrepeatable. So like all three of those kind of dimensions of human being have to be, we have to hold on to all of those. Um, even though I think most theories of gender want to kind of let go of either the differentiation um, and just say either every single individual is unique. There's no, there's no real sexual differentiation, right? Um, anyway, so that's kind of my, my long answer to that. That's helpful. Uh, I see David Lay on the call, and um, he was, uh, it was, uh, I believe, his daughter that recommended your book to him. <laughs> I okay. wondered if he had a question. He He's uh, teaching, or he's retired from teaching uh, uh, social geography. Um, David, do you have a, a question or comment? Uh, am, I, am I calling you out? Sorry. 
Well, uh, indeed, you have called me out. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to say, first of all, to, to thank you, Abigail, for a really a fascinating and quite excellent presentation uh, as you wound your way through uh, a labyrinth is much too gentle a term, uh, a series of swamps, I think, and you kept on firm ground all the way through. So thank you so much. And your book indeed was very helpful. The, I, I guess if I have a question, uh, it's to think very much about the politics of where we are today. And in the preoccupation that you've presented of the, the gender view, uh, it's not, uh, as you've hinted once or twice, uh, really a debate, it's uh, a shouting match. And it's a shouting match where the rules are certainly not Robert's rules. Uh, and it seems to me that in this shouting match, the most powerful argument of all on the side of the uh, uh, of, of, of the gender theorists is if you do not allow this child to uh, undertake a transition, he or she will kill themselves. And that is, I mean, in, in a world now where harm minimization seems to be uh, almost at the top of social justice thinking, how on earth does one have a Christian perspective and argue against uh, a position that says, if you do not allow this self-understood uh, gender dissatisfaction to have a logical medical outcome, then this child may indeed end their life. Uh, do you understand what I'm saying? I do. Yes, yeah. that is the that that is the card. That is the discussion ender for sure. Um, and it's it's a it's a claim that's falsifiable based on evidence, right? So again, this isn't going to be a quick fix. I'm sure there will be, you know, committed true believers who will not be persuaded by evidence, but there is actually no evidence to support that claim. So that narrative is not an evidence-based claim. There's actually a really, one of the best studies on this just came out in Finland because there are very few studies on outcomes for youth, longitudinally speaking, but one that just came out that um, has a good sample size, pretty high quality evidence, which is unusual in gender medicine to have good evidence on anything. Um, and this study um, debunked that that narrative, um, came out of Finland. I could give Gordon that information if you want to see it. Um, sure. But also, even aside from that study, so I've, I've done a deep dive into this particular question. And I'll tell you why, actually. So the reason I first got interested in the transgender question was actually before I became Catholic, before I reverted back to Christianity. Um, and I remember reading an Atlantic piece that was actually, I think it was Atlantic. It was on the expansion of euthanasia in Belgium, the euthanasia program. And Belgium was just starting to euthanize people for uh, reasons not having to do with terminal illness. And then the very, at very bottom of this, I had this like profound memory of reading this and getting to the very bottom of it, the article, because I remember I was on my phone reading it. And then it described the first person who was euthanized under this new rule was a transgender person. And that rattled me because I just had this view that like, oh, of course we, you know, people transition to avoid suicide. So then just reading this story about the state basically facilitating the suicide of a transgender person was like, it just like, come, you know, kind of rattled my progressive brain. I was like, well, ah, how does this work? You know, this. So I started actually looking at um, researching this. And I, this was, you know, back, I think in 2013. And that, at that time, one of the only good studies out was a 2011 study out of Sweden, which is a population based study um, that compared causes of death of trans identified people 
with the general population. So this can't show causation of any kind of particular treatment. It can just so, show correlation. But what was shocking about this study was that um, that people who had transitioned had um, like a 19-fold increase in suicidality compared to the general population. And that, again, really rattled me because it wasn't the narrative, right? So that's kind of how I, st I was actually on this question that I started to begin to, to have questions about this narrative. Um, so that claim is not well supported by evidence. There is also some evidence that indicates um, that, uh, that suicidality can increase after transition as well. Um, so that, in fact, there's some evidence to the that to the counterclaim. But again, it's not like wholly conclusive. But that's where I would go um, when presented with this is to really to spell out the evidence. And I do have like presentations. I have talks where I like go through the studies. Um, and what's interesting is that the studies that have been done on this question, they track these outcomes both across culture and across time in a particular culture. So, and it's pretty consistent that suicidality is higher post-transition, or at least that transition doesn't appear to kind of alleviate suicidality in the, the way this simplistic narrative claims. What, what about the prevention of transition? And what so, about, what about so, it? Okay. Sorry, yeah. I, I missed the last part of your question. I, I mean, the argument is if you do not allow transition to occur, then suicide becomes a likely outcome. So it's, right. it's one issue to talk about su suicide after transition, but what about suicide with the prevention of transition? Right. So there's like two pieces to this counter argument. The first is that there's no good evidence that transition will prevent suicide. So that's mm -hmm. the first piece. Yeah. The second piece is that there is in fact some evidence that it might make the problem worse, yeah. right? Yeah. And there's evidence for both sides of that claim, right? So um, yeah, that's where I would go. Okay, thank you.